morning, everybody. Um, I'm just here to introduce Professor Steve Butchik, who's going to be our first speaker today. Um, Steve is a professor in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Sydney, and is the Director of Neurophysiology and Consultant Neurologist at Westmead Hospital. He also co-runs the Motor Neuron Disease Clinic at St Joseph's Hospital and he heads the Neuromuscular Service at Westmead. Steve has published over a hundred research papers and he has received a number of awards for his contribution to MND research. His main area of research has been un uncovering the underlying pathophysiological processes that govern motor neuron disease and in particular the use of threshold tracking transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS and that's used to detect cortical excitability. One of Steve's most recent papers was published in the Lancet Neurology which is hugely exciting and results indicated that TMS is a sensitive diagnostic biomarker in motor neuron disease and when it's used with existing diagnostic criteria, it may be useful to speed up the process of diagnosis for people with motor neuron disease. So this could support earlier interventions for patients, as well as inclusion in clinical trials. On top of all that, he's just a really nice bloke as well. <laughs> so thank you, Steve, for taking the time out to come and speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the, to the SIG group for inviting me. It's a great honour to be with you today, and I think this is a hugely important meeting for MND patients because you guys are at the coalface of treating the MND patients. The neurologists are not really that important. It's, uh, it's you guys that are the most important uh, aspect of their management. Uh, today I'd like to talk about some of the phenotypes of MND how they progress and, uh, and I guess that sort of uh, morphs into trajectory and some therapies and touch upon some of the stuff that we're doing with brain excitability just to provide a commonality of links between different phenotypes. So to start off with, I mean everything began with this guy here, well, called Jean-Martin Charcot, who was a French neurologist, neuropathologist, and I don't think he was a psychologist, although he could have been. and. Uh, Charcot's acclaimed for many things, but one of the things that he described was motor neuron disease. So he had, I think, 14 patients with this rapidly progressive disorder. Back then, the age of onset was in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, so it was uh, uh, even more devastating uh, than it is now, I guess it, it still is, but uh, uh, it was uh, rapidly progressive and these patients passed away very quickly. And so he uh, was also an accomplished neuropathologist, uh, and on sectioning of their spinal cord, this is an example of the spinal cord, he found that there was loss of these motor neurons, which he termed amyotrophy, and there was also hardening of the, uh, of the lateral column, so the, the nerves that connect your brain to the spinal uh, motor neurons, that is, the nerves that are very important for fine motor tasks. And it was Charcot who coined the term amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and he proposed back then that perhaps the motor neuron disease starts up here in the, spot in the brain and that these nerves, the fact that they are, they are dysfunctional, he didn't use the term hyperexcitability, he used the term dysfunctional, drives uh, the motor neuron uh, uh, degeneration, which is quite an important observation. And uh, uh, that question has been uh, played out for the last 100 odd years, 140 years or 55 years with uh, people that are pro and anti uh, that theory. I fall into the pro camp. Now motor neuron disease is best known for uh, affecting this famous American baseball player called Lou Gehrig disease and it really uh, devastated uh, his career. He died some two years after he developed motor neuron disease and I'd like to just uh, show this video just to sort of illustrate how devastating this condition is. stunned the country. And on July 4th, a huge, sad crowd packed Yankee Stadium to pay tribute to their beloved hero. 
Babe Ruth came back and the two old teammates ended their long feud. Manager Joe McCartney presented him with a trophy. At first, Gary was too moved to speak. two years later of what is now called Lou Gehrig's disease. So Lou Gehrig had lower limb onset motor neuron disease and he died and his life expectancy was about two years. Now there are some other fam famous Australians. Scott Gale died from motor neuron disease also at a very young age and also Prohart died from uh, MND. So this disease strikes uh, people across the board of our society, but it seems to be a little bit somewhat more prevalent in sports people for reasons that are unknown. But uh, that's its definition. Pro uh, it produces a, a progressive weakness of the voluntary muscles. Its prevalence is four to six per hundred thousand. It's probably the commonest of all the acquired neuromuscular diseases that we see with the, with the exception of perhaps myasthenia gravis. But its survival still remains only three to five years in the majority of patients. But there is a heterogeneity to the phenotype. A small percentage of patients can survive for a, a more prolonged period of time. But the striking statistics, statistic is that two Australians die every day from motor neuron disease, which is certainly more than safe from conditions like HIV or Parkinson's disease or even MS. Now, motor neuron disease, uh, as we call it here in Australia and the UK, or ALS in France and Lou Gehrig disease, really refers to sort of this Venn diagram um, uh, 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 classification. It's a mixture of upper and lower motor neuron signs and I'll focus on that initially and then I'll talk about uh, the uh, other outliers uh, in a second. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, sclerosis is characterized by asymmetric onset, uh, usually in the upper limbs, but about a quarter of the patients can have bulbar uh, uh, onset disease. And it's, uh, the, the classic feature is a combination of what we refer to as upper motor neuron signs, that is brisk reflexes, increased tone, exaggerated jaw jerk, etc., uh, together with lower motor neuron signs. Clinically, that manifests as muscle weakness and wasting, uh, muscle twitching or fasciculations, which I'll show you in a second. And these occur within the same region, sort of one arm. They have to occur together. Uh, so Charcot was quite intuitive about the observations and this forms the crux of diagnosis of ALS or motor neuron disease so as we know So the diagnosis of ALS MND is really based on a clinical and neurophysiological assessment. There is what's referred to as a NAWAGI criteria which was uh, formulated in 2006 which incorporates upper and lower motor neuron signs. So one of the modifications was that uh, this consensus criteria suggested that you should use nerve conduction studies and needle EMG to confirm your diagnosis because prior to that we'd use just clinical findings of you know muscle wasting and weakness and by the time we were picking this up 70% of the motor neurons had already, part, had already died so uh, 
we came to the realization, well, they came to the realization, which was an observation for a long time, that if you objectively assess the muscles um, with needle EMG, you can pick up things far before they manifest clinically. And perhaps if you then institute certain measures, you can prolong life and improve quality of life. But here's an example of what we refer to as ongoing activity, which is a marker of acute or, or active nerve loss. So when we put a needle into a muscle that may look clinically normal, they have this pitter-patter of sound. So they're called fibrillations. And then if you, if you then look at how they contract their muscle, they have these very large units, which means that the muscles or the nerves are trying to modify, trying to grow. So one nerve dies and its neighbor tries to take over, and that's why it looks big. And you need both of those things to, uh, to help you with uh, making a diagnosis of motor neuron disease. And there is a criteria, like with anything, so, uh, and that's uh, the, uh, the criteria itself has three levels of certainty. If you have, uh, if you have three or more regions involved, and one arm is a region and a leg is a region, um, and say if you have your bulbar involved and that's a third region, well we can say you've got definite uh, uh, ALS MND. If you have two regions it's probable. Having definite or probable is a positive diagnosis and that's important because you can then recruit them into any therapeutic trials, you can start Riluzol, etc. And then if the, the problem is when they present very early, which they often do, just with a little bit of weakness in the hand, uh, that's when the diagnosis is uncertain and it remains uh, relatively uncertain. Uh, and at that stage we label them as possible and we say to the patients, well, we think you might have it, but you know, we need to see you back in six months' time to see whether uh, you've progressed. And that's a terrible way to manage a patient. There's no certainty, there's no uh, definition about the diagnosis uh, and the institution of therapy. So often if I suspect somebody's got motor neuron disease, I will discuss this with them, but I will also say to them, well, we need to exclude other things as well. And, and it's very important to give patients hope. Now, one other feature that is typical of the uh, Charcot's type ALS is this so-called split hand phenomena, whereby the lateral aspect of your hands, the first dorsal interosseous muscle here, okay, and the, and the abductor pulsus brevis are wasted and weak in uh, excess of the lateral, of the sort of more medial hand muscles, the hyperthenar eminence. And virtually nothing else produces that apart from motor neuron disease. And if you see that, that's a, uh, uh, that's a bad pointer to the diagnosis. Or, and we think that basically relates to a greater cortical representation of these muscles uh, in the motor cortex. That's why we think that occurs in ALS. One other thing that we've picked up with um, uh, my colleague Dr. Menon is this split hand phenomena, which is, seems also to be specific. So this patient's trying to abduct their thumb. You'll notice that as they try to abduct their thumb, the their distal thumb is bending. See? See how that's strong? Now I can tell you this movement and this movement is supplied by the same nerve and the same spinal motor nerves. So that's the CAT1 nerves. Uh, and we've uh, put, put together a paper and we found that this is quite a specific feature for ALS comparing it to non-ALS patients, so people that can look like motor neuron disease but are not. So clinically you can sort of start to dissect out the ALS phenotype from uh, non-ALS uh, with a fairly good sensitivity. And again, we think that probably relates to issues with brain function. The APB has a greater cortical representation than your flexor pulsus longus. Now, in terms of the trajectory, again, uh, this is very heterogeneous for ALS. And, uh, uh, and often patients ask me, well, doctor, how long do I have? And a lot of my colleagues would say to them, well, not a lot, but thankfully now, but some of them would say, well, you've got one to two years and, uh, you know, you should get your life in order, which is, you know, that significantly um, depresses the patient, it, it makes them lose hope in the medical profession, and it's wrong. 
it's wrong. What you have to say to them, well, we have to see how the disease has evolved in you. And with Julie Labra and the team at uh, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, we put together a recent, a nice uh, collection of data that was recently uh, accepted for publication in JNMP, looking at the rate of disease progression. Now, the way we calculated that is we calculate their immediate, their instantaneous ALS FRS score, which everybody does, and that tells us about how disabled they are at that point. Uh, and we subtract it from the total score, which is 48. When you're normal, it's 48. And we divide it by their disease duration. So if they, uh, if they progressed very rapidly, so the score is 1.11, we know they're not going to do well. They're going to continue to progress, and their life expectancy is going to be much shorter than if their rate of disease progression is much slower, that is less than 0.47. If they're in between, well, they have an intermediate type of prognosis. And these are statistically derived uh, groups, and Julie, through her statistical knowledge, has sort of calculated these. And this is quite an important, I think, tool when you're seeing somebody for the first time uh, to get a, a gauge or an idea of how quickly they're going to progress. But the whole point of this slide is ALS has a heterogeneity to its disease progression. Even the most typical phenotype can vary in the rate of progression, and we don't quite understand what regulates this uh, rate of disease progression. Now, the other extreme is a predominantly lower motor neuron form of ALS. This is clinically predominantly lower motor neuron. Uh, the, the name is a bad, no, bad name. It's called PMA, or progressive muscular atrophy. And it's a hodgepodge of things. But the classic feature is this man in the bar barrel, or the flail arm variant ALS. This is a disease that predominantly starts in the upper limbs, affecting the shoulder girdle muscles. So the patient walks as though they've got a barrel around their upper chest, so they can't sort of abduct their arms. It's an unusual uh, phenotype. Uh, it predominates in males. It's got a very slow disease progression. And clinically, it does not have upper motor neuron features. That is, when you tap their reflexes, they're not brisk. They're in actual fact it's absent. absent. The whole point is, is that this unusual phenotype, you have to th think in the back of your mind, even if the patient presents with massive fasciculations, that uh, you can uh, evolve into this. But this you have to treat this slightly, well, very differently to your typical ALS phenotype because their prognosis is different and their need for services are clearly different. Um, we need to sort of be mindful of that and tailor treatment to the phenotypes. Uh, for a long time there was an argument as to whether this is um, whether this is ALS or not. And we did some studies using our TMS techniques, and we found that uh, they had an ALS signature. That is, they were hyper-excitable compared to normal controls, and even more so hi uh, hyper-excitable than typical ALS patients. So clearly, that hyper-excitability, we felt, was a trigger, but not a controller of disease progression. So turning back slightly to the cousin of a flail arm variant is the flail leg variant. And this is not the fl this is not typically typical of the flail arm variant in the set the way we define it sorry is confinement of disease to the legs for at least 12 months and you have to try and distinguish that from lower limb onset ALS because the prognosis is very different the way we define it the only way that we have uh, thus far is to look at the time. If they've had disease confined to their legs clinically and neurophysiologically for 12 months, well, they've probably got the flail leg variant. Um, they can have brisk reflexes, but they don't have to, so they can have upper motor neuron signs. What they can't have is hypertonia, and they can't have clonus. So they can just have brisk reflexes, but not the extremes of upper motor neuron dysfunction. And if you look at this variance, this is a big paper that was published by Nigel Lee in collaboration with Paul Talman from Beth, uh, from, uh, uh, and Susan Mathers from uh, Victoria. What, they looked at the various Project, the trajectory uh, of these various phenotypes, and they compared the flail leg to the flail arm to the PMA. And a PMA is just lower limb onset. It, it can be in the leg, can be in the arm, can be in the throat. Um, and they compared it to limb onset disease and bulbar onset ALS. And you find that the trajectory is, you know, they still progress, but their trajectory is much slower 
than the limb onset disease. And again, like with the flail arm variants, you need to be aware of this and you need to tailor your therapy to that patient. So this person is going to be around for a much longer period of time uh, and need a lot more services than somebody with limb onset disease and the services are going to be slightly different. So that's the lower motor neuron predominant form. Now switching back and jumping through our mix and going up to the upper motor neuron predominant form, the primary lateral sclerosis. Now this is uh, an extremely rare form of MND. Most, 80% is ALS, about 5% uh, about are PMA and about 1% are PLS in our experience. But we seem to have an overrepresentation of PLS and they're a really difficult group because they can be confused with a multiple sclerosis, especially the progressive form of MS, with hereditary spastic paraple uh, paraplegia and various other hodgepodge of neuromuscular disorders. And, you know, we've got no good way of confirming this diagnosis but time. The, the official diagnostic criteria uses a, a time period of four years. And the definition is that you have to have pure upper motor neuron involvement without any lower motor neuron involvement either clinically or with your needle for at least four years. So if somebody presents to me today and they say, doctor, I've got stiff legs and I can't walk and I look at them and they've got brisk reflexes and upgoing toes and you know they're 50 and you say well and there's no family history of HSP and you say well you've probably got this unusual form of motor neuron disease but I don't know uh, I, we've got to wait for four years you could end up being upper motor neuron predominant ALS which is a different trajectory uh, that's, I mean, that's not strictly true, but that's a hyperbolic view. In, in the strictest sense of the terms, that's how we define PLS. But there are, there are studies that us and others have done which have kind of tried to stratify and improve the diagnosis, and I'll go into that in a second. But the definition is, a pure upper motor neuron for at least four years. Uh, the other thing is, they have to be above the age of 40, because the 40 is a magic cutoff for this genetic hereditary spastic paraplegia. But again, that's just a relative, not an absolute thing. Uh, and it's important to consider this diagnosis because they live for a prolonged period of time. They do get cognitive problems. And again, you have to tailor the therapy to the PLS phenotype. They have different needs. Now, so with my colleague, Dr. Giver Singer and a few other uh, eminent people in Sydney who are interested in both HSP and ALS. We recently put together a paper of 14 PLS patients and compared them to a, hereditary, to a pure form of hereditary spastic paraplegia. We knew that this HSP had a particular gene called uh, the spastin gene, which is the commonest, and we looked at ALS um, phenotype, Charcot's ALS. And a couple of things emerged. Bulba dysfunction which was predominantly upper motor neuron, so that like a spastic dysarthria, was far more common in PLS. So if you found that, you, you have to think about PLS uh, as opposed to HSP. And if you had urinary problems, so urgency and, or uh, incontinence, etc., you'd have to think of PLS over ALS. So ALS don't get any bladder problems. PLS uh, can. So, and the other things weren't really uh, all that helpful, apart from some sensory symptoms. Oh, oh sorry, that's the other thing. Uh, if you had sensory symptoms, pins and needles and tingling and numbness in your feet, then and, and a stiff spastic gait and urinary problems, you're more likely to have HSP or MS than uh, PLS. So again, the, uh, the go a good clinical judgment and assessment of the patient is absolutely critical. And one of the other things using our TMS thing, just to sort of plug our research, we find that they, their cortex is inexcitable in a greater proportion of patients. And that's because there's a lot more degeneration uh, at a paradoxically at a motor cortex level. Now, the other group that I wanted to just touch upon here is the pure bulbar palsy group. Um, so we looked at this with a colleague of mine, James Barrell from Neuro and Concord, who's interested in frontotemporal dementia. So working with Matthew Keenan at Prince of Wales, we identified a number of patients who had bulbar onset disease, and we thought, oh, this is not good. 
but they kept on living for a prolonged period of time. Uh, they were mostly females. It's much more common in, in females than, uh, although not, statistic not statistically significantly so. Uh, the symptom duration was low at the time of assessment just because when we assessed them, but if you looked at their uh, survival, it's much longer than bulbar onset ALS. And the thing about it is, is that these patients have a lot of, lot more flat, uh, either uh, spastic or mixed type of uh, dysarthrias and far less limb involvement. So these patients remain confined to the throat for a prolonged period of time. They, and their major deficit is, is an arthria. They seem not to have a lot of silaria and they don't have respiratory problems. Uh, it's not a huge problem and their limbs are fine. So their issue is communication. One of the patients uh, after being diagnosed worked as a nurse for a number of years. So uh, uh, again, you have to think about this phenotype because the trajectory is really flat. They, they don't progress like your Charcot's ALS and you have to tailor your uh, therapy to them. Perhaps getting some assistive devices and getting them, um, getting their life back on track with regards to that. Another group of ALS patients uh, is the genetic form. So they, uh, once upon a time, we thought they comprised about 10% of all the ALS cohort, but with the discovery of the C9 orth gene in 2011, that's kind of changed the picture. So about, uh, about oh, up to 20% of people that we thought was, were sporadic could have uh, abnormalities in this gene. The SOD1 gene is the first one described, and I won't describe, uh, I won't go into that, but just to say, typically they produce the ALS phenotype, the Charcot's ALS phenotype, and you cannot differentiate sporadic from familial ALS. There are some caveats to the C9 orth gene. So the C9 orth gene was rather exciting because it really underlined the multi-facetedness uh, of ALS, that it was a multi-system disorder, not just confined to the motor neurons. It linked it with, uh, with frontotemporal dementia. This gene, which is a hexanucleotide repeat expansion, so G, 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 double C, so these are, these are uh, uh, um, not amino acids, they're um, uh, building blocks, your DNA particles. Uh, this expansion is in the intronic portion, the non-coding region of this gene. We don't know what this gene does. We don't know what this mutation does. It probably uh, causes toxicity, but we don't know. And the important thing is it can produce both frontotemporal dementia, but it can produce also motor neuron disease within the same family. Uh, and um, this is an example of cortical dysfunction in somebody who's got motor neuron disease. Uh, and the original cohort, you can see, it, it tends to equally affect males and females. The thing about this disease is that apart from, the trajectory is very similar to uh, typical ALS, but it seems to have a younger age of onset in the, in the sort of late 40s, early to mid 50s. And it seems to have a, progress slightly more rapidly. Now, but this sort of opened up this whole Pandora's box of cognitive dysfunction in ALS. And a uh, uh, paper published by Ola Hardiman, probably one of the nicest papers published on this topic, showed that over 50% of our ALS patients have some sort of cognitive impairment. You know, uh, dementia, frank dementia, can be seen in up to 15% uh, up to of patients, 15, 16% of patients. Frontotemporal dementia is the predominant one, whether it be executive or semantic, et cetera. Um, but uh, there's a whole group of people here who have either executive dysfunction or have non-executive cognitive dysfunction. So they're not demented but cognitively they're not right, and that can interfere with various decision-making uh, processes. Uh, and this illustrates that the dysfunction can be in either a single domain, but it can be in many domains. Memory can be affected, language can be affected, visual spatial skills can be affected. So this uh, does affect how we treat and how we inform our patients. And the thing that seems to be important in uh, governing who gets uh, these non-demented cognitive impairments, oops, sorry, 
uh, is their pre-morbid uh, pre IQ. So if their IQ is lower, they, they're more likely to develop uh, these problems. Uh, and their level of pre-morbid uh, education. So if they've had less education and a lower IQ, for some reason, they tend, to, they tend to be more likely to develop these cognitive impairments. So I guess the social history is even more important uh, in the ALS patients now. Now, what of the pathophysiology? In the last 10 minutes, I'd like to focus a little bit on the pathophysiology. We don't quite understand what governs our various phenotypes. Clearly, uh, in my mind, I don't think Charcot's ALS is the same as you know, the, the flail arm ALS or the flail leg. I think there are subtleties in the pathophysiology, but the pathophysiology is itself heterogeneous, sorry. There are a number of different things that can, at a cellular level, that can contribute to degeneration and, you know, genetics, mitochondrial dysfunction, the way you transport your uh, proteins up and down from the head to the tail, your iron homeostasis, your inflammatory cells, your supporting cells, and we focused on excitotoxicity, which seems to be a very important uh, pathogenic mechanism, and that's the only one that we can modify to a certain extent, and I'll focus on that in a second. But as Julie mentioned, we do uh, a work in vivo, looking at uh, uh, adult, looking at patients using this transcranial magnetic stimulation, where we stimulate the brain and we record from a muscle in the hand, and that gives us an idea about how excitable the brain is. And uh, this is just normal controls, you, me, everybody else. We all have a level of excitability. This is inhibition and this is facilitation. And it's all mediated by these interneuronal networks that are located in your grey matter. And we know that things like um, GABA, well, like the sleeping tablets, sort of are very important in modulating this. So in ALS patients, what we find is when we compare uh, ALS to controls, there's an there's a increase in this hyperexcitability. It seems to be more prominent in limb onset patients, perhaps because we're, we're just recording from the hand. Uh, and it seems to be a very early feature of ALS, sporadic ALS. It is also found in familial ALS caused by mutations in the SOD1 gene. So this is the familial, this is the sporadic, not different at all. And it also seems, is, it's also evident in uh, uh, C9 off uh, ALS. So the, that's the green line here. So irrespective of your, what your underlying gene is, you're gonna ha your brain is going to be hyperexcitable. But what's interesting is that if you're born with the gene, you don't develop this hyperexcitability. So this is a, these are the carriers. So these are the people that have the gene, but not the disease. They're not hyperexcitable they have normal level of excitability and they're clinically normal until about four to five months before they start to get to the, the, the catastrophic loss of motor neurons. Then there seems to be a switch and they become hyperexcitable. Uh, so this is just saying it seems to be that cortical hyperexcitability is a some sort of final common pathway or, or certainly one of the pathways towards finality irrespective of whatever the predisposing factors are. And uh, uh, th there's a recent important paper published by Amar al Chalabi from England suggesting that ALS is a multi-step process. So they did some mathematical modeling and what they found was that you start down here, you've got some predisposing factor, whether it be your genes, whether it be whatever, in utero exposure, and then you need to be exposed to six consensual factors before you get motor neuron disease. In contrast to MS, which seems to be an all or nothing phenomenon, what those six consecutive, consecutive factors are, we don't know. And identifying those, I think, would be very, very important in controlling the rate of disease progression, but even hopefully stopping the disease. Uh, and uh, this has led uh, uh, Andrew Eisen, a preeminent ALS scientist, to suggest that you were perhaps born to get motor neuron disease. He feels that the, uh, this preclinical period dates back to conception. And then you're exposed to various inflammatory, excitotoxic, and other factors in your life to get 
uh, neuronal degeneration. And this period here is very important because if, uh, because if you can then, if you can identify the patients in this stage and perhaps hit them with various neuroprotective therapies, you might be able to slow the disease progression. I don't know about this. It's, it's an interesting theory, um, but it's a, there's certainly a lot more research to be had at this. And, uh, uh, but one thing is sure, uh, and this is our paper from Lancet Neurology, we found that hyperexcitability is a specific thing and it doesn't seem to be an adaptive process. So people have asked, well, isn't the brain just becoming hyperexcitable in response to your lower motor neuron loss to compensate for the lower motor neurons? We don't think that's the case because when you compare ALS to non-ALS who have an equal amount of lower motor neuron loss, there are huge differences in in excitability. So they're, they're not hyperexcitable, whereas the, whereas the ALS patients are hyperexcitable. So we think that's a very important pathogenic uh, process. And, and that sort of leads me on to uh, treatment, because <coughs> modulating these various factors can be very important in slowing down disease progression. And you all would have heard of Rilazol. Uh, that's the only effective therapy that we have thus far albeit partially effective, and it works by blocking this axis here, this sort of glutamate excitotoxicity. Um, and uh, what was, uh, what was uh, established was that when you compare Rilazol to placebo, you certainly slow down the disease progression. You don't reverse it, but you slow it down significantly. Uh, and uh, it seems to, well, in this study, seem to uh, be more effective in bulbar onset uh, patients uh, as, compared to, as compared to limb onset. Uh, and a subsequent study uh, stratified patients into what they referred to as high risk and low risk. So people that are going to do well with Rilazol versus those that, that are not going to do as well. And they came up with a bunch of uh, b uh, demographic and baseline variables. So for example, if you're older, uh, you're not going to do as well with Rilazol, and if, you're, if you have a more rapid disease at the outset, you're not going to do as well, or if you've got respiratory dysfunction, etc. So these are all of the things that we need to keep in mind. But Rilazol should form the crux of your therapy. The other thing that should form the crux of your therapy is a multidisciplinary ALS clinic, because they work. The multidisciplinary ALS clinics prolong life, but more importantly, they improve the quality of life. And that's by addressing issues such as breathing and uh, institution of PEG tubes, but also appropriate referral to uh, our, uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, at, uh, our palliative care colleagues, for management of uh, specific uh, symptoms such as salaria and so on. And if you look at the survival in a general neurology clinic, it's far worse than if you look at this, uh, the trajectory in the ALS clinic. So ALS clinics work. Now, changing tack slightly, uh, one of the th tantalizing things that seems to control the rate of disease progression is the immune system. So the immune system has a neuroprotective component called the regulatory, regulatory component. And the brain itself has an uh, immune system as well. And recently it was uh, reported that the brain has a lymphatic system, which was not known. So the immune system seems to sort of for a long time battle against the, 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 uh, the processes that, gen that cause degeneration by damping down those cytotoxic and nasty immune cells. Uh, and it, it's neuroprotective, it slows down uh, disease uh, progression and it prolongs survival in animal models. And in our cohort, so this is some of the uh, studies that we've recently, well, well hopefully we're going to publish, uh, we found that these Tregs are higher in ALS compared to controls. And what's very important is that it uh, correlates with the disease progression. The faster your disease progression, the less T cells you have. And working with Bradley Turner at the Howard Floor Institute, we found that these T regs can prolong life in the animal model, which got us very excited because we've got a quite a powerful MS Biological Molecular Genetics Research Group at Westmead uh, and a phototherapy group. And we found, well, what if we enhance these T regs using phototherapy? Because you can actually increase them significantly. <laughs> and you use phototherapy for psoriasis, you know. And so we're 
about to launch a, a photoneuron trial using narrowband ultraviolet B light to see whether we can slow down disease progression in ALS. It's a harmless treatment, uh, it's very safe, uh, so it, the worst thing is it may not work. The other way to enhance these cells is to give them monoclonal antibodies. Now you don't want to give anybody monoclonal antibodies unless they uh, unless you have to because they make the patients really sick. So hopefully we'll be reporting on our phase one trials this time next year. Now one other thing that has emerged, obviously you would have heard about stem cells and genetic therapies and that's kind of, that's got people excited. Um, there have been uh, various stem cell trials that have been conducted in the US. Most of these stem cell trials have injected cells in the spinal cord. So they've used neuronal embryonal cells so derived from a uh, frozen embryo that was, a, that was sort of, I think, derived from IVF. Uh, and it was safe, um, but uh, the thing is, the st studies were very small. There was no efficacy, but it was safe. The question really is, given the C9 off discovery and our research and other people's research, should you be injecting in here? or should you be using more sophisticated therapies to modify these non, you know, these non-neuronal cells? This group here, um, Brian Casper's group uh, in the U.S. I think they're located. What they did, they actually modified the astrocytes. So they uh, genetically modified the astrocytes from a, uh, an astrocyte bearing a, a, a genetic mutation for ALS to one that didn't, and they found that this was neuroprotective. So this, uh, albeit this was in a cell culture model, and, this, and that was quite exciting because it, it, it could sort of, uh, it, it opens up the door for nanoparticle therapy in ALS. And my feeling is that the first step would be to s stop the disease progression, stop the disease process, and, uh, or slow it down significantly such that it doesn't, you know, doesn't progress to respiratory failure and death. And I think that's all very exciting. And, and people have also looked at oligonucleotide therapies where they've given uh, bits of DNA to switch off the genetic mutation. It's safe, but the efficacy studies are still uh, pending. Uh, but certainly uh, the, uh, the stem cell guys think that we should be targeting the brain as well as the spinal cord to uh, make our therapy more efficacious. So I might stop there.